uh, welcome once again and uh, good morning and thanks for being here so early in the morning. Um, so we opened uh, the conference we have our first uh, intimate plenary session. Uh, now we are talking, they will talk about living with friends and uh, we will have uh, Lucia Santos for the Portuguese case. Uh, Beatrice Guzman for the Italian case and Pablo Pérez Navarro for the Spanish case. Um, Ana Lucia Santos will start uh, with, her, uh, with her presentation uh, To live with you is to live with the world, living with friends and the heterotopic citizenship. Thank you, Tatiana. Good morning, everyone. So, let's talk about friendship. In friendship, there is no original event, such as what we call falling in love. When we fall in love, we are operating in the mode of epiphany. In friendship, there is no original event or epiphany. Friendship is a process. There is no one single event through which friendship is revealed. Quite to the contrary, friendship has to develop through time. This is a quote. Uh, this is a quote from Eva, Eva Ayu during the conference on love, friendship and capitalism in 2015. This idea of friendship as a process is shared by many other philosophers and sociologists and they often contrast friendship with other personal or social relations, relations to highlight its voluntary and creative character. It is a relationship that has to be sustained actively. When engaging in a friendship, there is the, the mutual commitment to be attentive and responsive to the friend's needs or desires. There is an ongoing process necessary to keep the relation between the parties. Because of its constructed character, it may be difficult to trace the moment when one becomes a friend. Indeed, that moment is more likely to not exist at all. And it makes not clear to identify if one is a friend or an acquaintance. We know when we do have a lover, but, well, most of the times, but we don't know exactly when we do have a friend, nor do we know most of the times when we no longer have that friend. Adam Smith, a Scottish philosopher, wrote about necessitudo. Necessitudo is a particular type of attachment described by the Romans as the mutual accommodation that produces friendship, that is to say, a relationship which results from necessity. With the advent of commercial societies, necessitude was apparently replaced by a morally superior form of relations, one based on natural sympathy, free from the coercion of need. Associated with the loss of traditional ties and the emergence of greater levels of uncertainty and insecurity, Choice is actually regarded as one of the constitutive features of how people organize modern relations. In the words of Marilyn Friedman, sorry, I forgot to, to press this, this slide, uh, but I have to continue. In the words of Marilyn Friedman, as adults, we choose our own friends, and together with our friends, we generate relationships that more than most other close personal ties reflect our choices and our desires. So we understand that friendship and choice are somehow interdependent, but when people cohabit with friends, as it happened with the participants in the study I conducted, it does not mean that this move was based on choice and free will. According to data we gather in interviews, the reason why people move in together with friends is mostly related to income. In recent years, Lisbon has been through a strong gentrification process. Under these circumstances, to live on their own, or even to live with other people, is becoming an enormous economic effort. As Patricia Pedrosa, uh, it, uh, she is an architect that I interview for this study, she explains, the financial crisis made the youngest generation aware that they will never have the resources to buy a house. Even renting it can be difficult. There are no stable jobs. So, even those who don't have the tradition of having studied in, an, in another city and never had the experience of sharing house in a university context, realize that cohabiting with friends is the only strategy for emancipation. 
what I found in my interviews was precisely people who are not students anymore, people who are young adults between 21 and 24 years old. We need to share a house because they do not have the economic stability to live alone. <laughs> in addition, there is a recent phenomenon in Lisbon that has been calling house bullying. House bullying is used to describe the actions made by the house owners to evict the tenants. And strategies vary from works in the building, causing floods, electricity power or water cuts, and similar actions that will hinder the living conditions in that house. House bullying is taking place in Lisbon because of the massive increase in tourism accompanied by the escalating rents. Therefore, it is more and more difficult to afford a house, especially in the center. Maria is a cisgender lesbian woman who has to leave the house where she has been living for the past four years because the owner is going to sell it to a state agency. She's facing difficulties to find an affordable house and the problem has not only to do with the prices but also with bureaucracies that people in precarious situations may be difficult to meet as it is for her. And she's ex she explained, we are in a very difficult situation. I don't have an employment contract and my father has a part-time job. Although I, do, although I don't have a contract, I have a salary that allows me to rent a house, but I don't have any proof of it. Last year, I was not in Portugal and where I was, I wasn't obliged to pay taxes. And now it is the situation of us being kicked out from the center. <coughs> LGBTQI plus people, like everyone else, are facing troubles to live a financially livable life. But differently from the majority, it seems vital to share the private sphere with someone who shares the same political awareness or principles. The voluntary character of friendship sustains the relation by and now I'm putting the uh, Friedman again, shared interests and values, mutual affection and possibilities for generation, for generating reciprocal respect and esteem, end of quote. And this is especially relevant for people uh, who live in vulnerable situations due to dominant discrimination. One of our participants, Karina, a cisgender lesbian woman, <coughs> chose Frederica to her habit precisely because she knew Frederica is a feminist and it will be easy going to live with her. The sense of safety and care provided by Frederica came in different ways, but I wanted to highlight the importance of feminism uh, in one of those, in one of, uh, in one episodes that Karina uh, has been through. She was, she was raped and she, she tell me, I was like for an hour lay down on the floor crying and she was there helping me, cuddling me saying that we are strong and we'll get, her, get over it. She didn't make any judgments because she has a feminist ethics and that was something really cool from her. The way Karina describes that moment is with gratitude and the feeling of acceptance and complicity. Contrary to what generally happens, she did not feel morally judged or accused for what had happened. And the feminist consciousness of Frederica had a crucial role on the support Karina received from her flatmate. But this support is not unidirectional. Our interviewees not only receive care, but they are also active in caregiving. Jasmine, a non-binary person living with a cisgender male friend, speaks about the contribution, and now I'm using gender pronoun, uh, they, they provide him because of their political engagement. They say, I am non monogamous and I am politically engaged regarding many issues and I think that living with Mike brought him names and discourses for him to live his relationships. Many times I feel that for him it is good to live with someone who doesn't judge him nor his relationships. And he can understand it now. We have a relationship of tremendous affection and support. The political engagement of Frederica and Jasmine contributes to a healthy understanding of their friends and the feeling of having created a safe space in their homes and in their relationships. According to Friedman, friendship has no social defining purpose, but it surely contributes to the well-being of people. This author says that through shared affection, mutual support, which contributes to self-esteem, friendship enables the cultural survival of people 
who deviate from social norms and who suffer hostility and ostracism from others for their difference. <coughs> Another aspect that I want to briefly highlight is what Will McKeithen names as the embodied sociality of animals. Not only friendship and same-sex same -sex relationships are redefining the meaning of family, but also pets. Ray, a non-binary person living with a cisgender woman, explains, I love her very much. I feel that dog as if she was my own. If Steph does not have the time or the capacity, or if she's going to be home late, I go off the dog without any problems. I give her food, I pet her, I give her whatever she needs. The new toys, it was me who gave them to her. Crystal is a fantastic dog, and it is a huge contribution to the house and to our relationship, yes. Pets are breaking the boundaries between human and animal, indoors and outdoors, and they are becoming part of the chosen family. Although homes are crafted as anthropocentric, non-humans produce domestic life, and we find in race discourse that the presence of the dog contributes to model the friendship and the domestic partnership by sharing love and responsibilities whenever it is needed. By challenging the expected rapper normative model, and this is the concept of Anna Cristina Santos, cohabitation between friends is fearing the ecology of home, and this is uh, uh, the concept of McKithen, in which domestic place becomes a heterotopic place detached from the meaning by which the house was originally designed. This input of heterotopia is the last point I would like to refer. Now moving away from the relationship between people themselves and, and to talk about uh, the relationship between friends and the house. In the order of things, Foucault borrows the term heterotopia from medicine and biology to theorize about a place in which several incompatible sites could juxtapose. If you think about buildings or houses, they also change their functions during history. For instance, to host traditional nuclear family across generations, to host people who live with <coughs> friends, to host tourists for short periods of time, to host a doctor's office or any other business. Heterotopias are spaces that depend on the social circumstances. What is once a heterotopia for someone, that is a place for the other, may be converted into a space for oneself or a shared space. We can use heterotopia to think about the houses where biologically non-related people cohabit as a queer heterotopic space in itself. As explained earlier by Pedroza, people mostly live in houses designed by architects or constructors which are originated from a succession of models repeated through time and sustained by a specific family type. In Lisbon, there are houses constructed for families with high economic power, offering a room with a small bathroom next to the service area. And this is a solution that dates from the 19th century and which extends until the middle of the 20th century, once it was a regular practice to have maids. And that particular house design simply lingered over time. Usually there are model, models that separate the private areas from common, from common areas, and sometimes there are not only two rooms, but there may be five rooms or more. One of them used as the office, especially when the man of the house in the old days was a lawyer or a doctor. And those houses can nowadays offer a solution for people who have different financial resources because each room has a different size or a peculiarity, and so the renting prices will vary according to that. To reiterate, people are living with friends in spaces that were designed for a traditional family type. And this is a point where one enters heterotopia, in a context in which it is culturally expected to be cohabiting with a romantic partner, rising a traditional family, buying a permanent house, etc. More and more people are moving from house to house instead, sharing private space with friends or unknown people for periods of time living a precarious life without legal recognition 
in their relations and comparative impacts. This phenomenon is what we might call heterotopic or a citizenship on the margins. The home that hosts friends is the house of failure, according to the dominant standards. The home of those who fail to meet the heterosexual adult script, where traditional linear time is rejected. By acknowledging the heterotopic character of the house that hosts friends but should be hosting a nuclear family instead, and by using heterotopia as a tool of analysis, we understand the multiplicity of significations and possibilities that may exist in the same place. It is a place where deviation happens. It is not accessible and not even desirable for everyone, to everyone, but it is where the most affectionate relations may take place <coughs> and where new forms of social practices occur detached from the hegemonic constraints of heteronormative citizenship. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. And now we have uh, Pablo Perez Navarro. Here. They will talk about public order and the biopolitics of friendship. Well, mm, these are the people that I had the honor to interview during the study on LGBTQ friendship and cohabitation in adult life. And as you can see, four of them are migrants in various administrative situations, from legal to undocumented. Nuria and Lola, in particular, are trans women from Latin America with a history of transphobia and prosecution in their countries of origin. Uh, and well, both are currently asylum seekers in Spain, where they have also experienced, if, if not persecution as such, at least uh, severe forms of transphobia. As for the only Spanish one, Victoria, she lives in a squatted rural house where former health professionals and patients have taken control over their space for almost a decade. Well, for different reasons, all of their stories have made me think about the politics of cohabitation in the wider frame of Europe as political territory. What follows uh, is me trying to make sense of this reading of this in relation with some concerns that have been haunting me during the whole intimate project. I'm thinking especially in previous studies on no monogamies, on queer reproductive practices, and on state control of the proper names of transgender people. In all of these studies, a certain legal formula appeared at one point or another of the research, always in an ambiguous terrain between the enforcement of the law and the enforcement of the moral order of society. I am referring to the slippery notion of public order which I'm trying to read from the point of view of biopolitics and the history of European racism. Well, since its eruption in European civil codes during the 19th century, this notion of public order turned into an essential part of state biopolitics of reproduction, gender, and kinship. Its common uses in the hands of jurors entail the exercise of what some of scholars describe as a quasi-legislative function. As a consequence, the uses of public order often surpass the limits of any meaningful separation of powers in Western liberal democracies. In this sense, public order is the legal dispositive through which the authoritarian logics of the state of exception, famously explored by George Ackenbein, disseminate in almost every instance of the administrative and judicial structure of the state. However, where the refugee camp stands as the paradigmatic form, heterotopic form of the state of exception, the genealogy of public order is closely bound to the institution of civil marriage. In historical terms, the order of public order is that of the monogamous, heterosexual, reproductive couple. This does not isolate, however, this legal dispositive from 
the delimitation of borders and margins of the community or the nation. On the contrary, its introduction in modern law was intended to put the performative power of the state at the service of constructing an imaginary political community and to defend it from alien, decaying, immoral social practices. In this sense, the biopolitics of public order are closely bound to the history of civil marriage and through it to that of European racism. Well, in one of his lectures at the Collège de France, Michel Foucault introduced a very compelling analysis of the relation between biopolitics and racism. If biopower is the governmental rationality substituting the sovereign right to kill for state management of life, then how do modern nations justify, he wondered, their need to kill people, to kill populations, and to kill such civil, civil, civilizations? Well, according to Foucault, this necropolitical side of biopower, as a shield member would call it, does not reside in a different rationality of power. In his view, the category, makes it, the category that makes it possible for biopower to exercise the right to kill in its own terms is no other than race. Racism, Foucault arts, is the strategy through which the other is depicted as a threat to the well-being of the group to the health of the population, or even to the survival of the species. Thanks to racism, the state performs the killing function in the name of life itself. Moreover, according to Foucault, the logics of racism concern not only racialized others, but all of those who are depicted as biocriminals of various kinds, on the basis of posing a similar threat to the moral strength of the community or of the nation. Public order was introduced in modern law precisely to protect Europe from various forms of biocriminality. Civil marriage had just been born during the French Revolution with a certain libertarian anti ecclesiastical pathos. Napoleon Bonaparte liked the invention and decided to maintain it as a governmental tool. Whoever civil marriage had to be called to order. For that purpose, the concept of public order was introduced in the sixth article of the code, of the Napoleonic Code, as a limit to the arrangements that could be established between free citizens. To be precise, though, the first use of public order as a legal notion dates from the preliminary address of the first draft of the Napoleonic Code. There, the jury is Yantiama Hipotali with the purpose that the publicity, the solemnity of marriages, I'm quoting him, may alone prevent those vague and illicit unions that are so unfavorable to the propagation of the species. And then he established that the legislator can, in the interest of public order, establish such impediments to marriages as they deem appropriate. Well, following, following the Islamophobic tradition of French political philosophers of the 18th century, those illicit unions included polygamy as one of the most prosecuted forms of biocriminality. Public order did not lose this constitutive exclusion when it propagated from one civil code to another, way beyond the limits of Europe, from Latin America to Japan. As a result, as Katharina Martins from the Center for Social Studies has art following Coaventura de Sousa Santos, monogamy draws an abyssal line between the Western and the Arab world, that is, a division such that the other side of the line vanishes as reality, becomes inexistent, and is indeed produced as non-existent. In other words, the biopolitics of public order impose a certain relational performativity, as Ana Cristina Santos puts it, within the community, while at the same time limiting its permeability to abject or biocriminal relational practices. Even nowadays, this element of, of the biopolitics of public order exposes 
polygamous and polyamorous people alike to uh, and polyamorous people alike, but also multiparental families that may be neither to specific forms of vulnerability and state violence. In Spain, for example, widows' pensions have been denied and deportations have been justified on the basis that polygamy sickens the Spanish public order. Well, in close relation to, but beyond the works of mononormativity, the biopolitics of public order play also a major part in the regulation of the reproductive field. This is made especially evident nowadays in the treatment given by European courts to, for example, transnational surrogacy arrangements. In Spain, in particular, the recognition of affiliations with two fathers in the birth certificate that surrogacy allows for await uh, for the approval of the Constitutional Court after, after that the Supreme Court decided that they were against the Spanish public order. The case of Portugal is also very interesting uh, at this regard. Recently, an altruistic model of surrogacy was approved, granting access to this technique to women with medical fertility problems. However, in May, the Portuguese Constitutional Court considered that some elements of this law were unconstitutional. Unfortunately, the reason was not, uh, were not the, 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 the reasonable concerns about the preservation of the constitutional principle of no, dis of no discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. After all, heterosexual couples were being granted access to surrogacy while gay couples were facing prison sentences. On the contrary, the Constitutional Court considered, among other issues, that any form of surrogacy represents an almost unbearable attack to the heterosexual order of the reproductive field. For example, the Vice President of the Constitutional Court defended in that sentence, which contains that no less than 10 public order based claims that whatever the law may say, whatever the law may say, he's the vice president of the Constitutional Court, uh, whatever it may forget, the conception of a child without a father is as absurd as that of a child without a mother. And, and moreover, he said, uh, rather it is in the nature of the human species that every child have a mother and a father, an evidence that the Constitution simply recognizes and proclaims. Well, this sentence comes, up, comes only two years after gays and lesbians were allowed to adopt children in Portugal, and also two years after lesbians and single mothers were granted access to reproductive technologies. In this sense, this sentence is part of a worrying backlash in reproductive rights in Portugal very especially if we read it, read it along with the recent impediments put by the, by the very same constitutional <coughs> court to artificial dissemination that seem intended to impact the most on lesbian couples. Well, <coughs> despite its variations from one country to another, which are especially evident in the terrain of the re regulations of the reproductive field, the biopolitics of public order are a force, for the most part, for the status quo. An exclusionary status quo, for that matter. Moreover, for some theorists, the dominant narratives of gay and lesbian rights, including same-sex marriages, for example, would be still entrenched in complex ways with this exclusionary and racist constitution of Western nation states. According to Jasmine Pouar, this would be the defining element of the homonationalist frame, demanding for a deep critique of lesbian and gay liberal rights discourses and how those rights discourses produce narratives of progress and modernity that continue to accord some populations access to citizenship, cultural and legal, at the expense of the delimitation and expulsion of other populations. Well, this course is depicting Islamic refugees as a threat to the security of women or LGBT people, 
are probably one of the most obvious and, and well-known examples of the works of homonationalism in contemporary Europe. If we take this seriously into account, and the genealogy of public order, well, when some European states conceptualize homophobic hate speech, for example, as a threat to public order, as Slovenia has recently done, well, we maybe should probably take a pause and expect to find at least some ambivalent effects in these policies before heading for the critical celebration of any advance regarding LGBTQ rights. It could be assumed that homonationalism serves as a way for opening the borders to at least uh, those who run away from homophobic or transphobic violence, institutional or otherwise. While the treatment given in European countries to gay, to, sorry, to LGBT asylum seekers, however, proves that hypothesis wrong. Transgender migrants, in particular, often find themselves trapped between biopolitical regimes clashing between them, leading to often unbearable situations in relation with gender recognition or access to hormone treatments. In addition, the police pressure leading to the deportation of those transgender mi migrants who happen to be also sex workers make it evident that the emerging nationalist layer of the biopolitics of public order benefits the mobility of only very specific groups of people. Well, to conclude, if the state tries to find shelter in the order of public order, it is for no other reason than its fear for a social impulse pushing in the opposite direction. Foucault provided also a very complete account of this impulse for public disorder. For gay culture to become an interesting political project, in PR, uh, it would need to become part of this impulse for creating new forms of relationships. And he provided a quite specific example. Why shouldn't I adopt uh, yeah, a friend who's 10 years younger than I am, and even if he's, if he's 10 years older? Rather than arguing that rights are fundamental and natural to the individual, we should try to imagine and create a new relational right that permits all possible types of relations to exist and not, to be, and not be prevented, blocked, or annulled by impoverished relational institutions. Sorry. <laughs> Apparently, Foucault longed for new forms of biocriminality perhaps similar to those vague and illicit unions that Porto Lee was thinking about, or perhaps he was thinking of totally unrecognizable and new ones, new kinds of relationships. Well, but when he suggested to use adoption in this unprecedented way, uh, in, in a way that for which the institution was not intended for at all, he was also thinking on how to turn these relational possibilities into a force of legal and institutional transformation. And the name he gave to this transformative social force was no other than friendship. Struggles for the recognition and the recognition of non-monogamous relationships, for queer reproductive uh, uh, practices, for the right of gender self-determination, and against uh, criminal border policies, all pertain, in my view, to this friendly input for public disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, so the last, inter the last paper, the last presentation, is uh, blurring the boundaries of intimacy Friendship and Networks of Care in Times of Precarity, and Beatrice Guzmano will talk to us about it. Uh, good afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. um, just a little hint in order to follow my presentation. I will read all the quotes of my interview, is, uh, but I will not read the quotes of people cited 
So you can read, for example, now Donna Haraway, and afterwards I will read all the quotes from my interviews. So let's start to talk about friendship. And the theme of this presentation is friendship, which has long since become a legitimate subject of sociological analysis. But even so, it is still a difficult concept to understand, invisibilized by a hierarchy of intimacy, as Shelley Bajon calls it, that hides the importance of friendship, focusing exclusively on institutionalized relationships, an expression with which I define family, kinship, and formal couple relationships such as marriage or civil union. However, by decentralizing romantic relationships, we can reveal a whole new world made of intimacies that are nuanced in terms of definition and recognition, yet sturdy in terms of emotional as well as material support provided. From a sociological perspective, friendship is revolutionary for its engagement with the society and for its transformative power. In the first part uh, of the presentation, I review some of the reflection on friendship coming from sociology as well as from activism, in order to show how friendship, particularly for lesbian, gay and bisexual people, acquires the transformative potential of questioning the traditional hierarchy of intimacy. Later, I describe the Italian socioeconomic context, developing the assumption that friendship, just like uh, any other relationships, must be analyzed within its context. It is from this particular context that a new concept of care arises, embedded in a network of interdependence that is not just left over from institutionalized relationship, relationships, but rather it is a way of being in the world, or citing Michel Foucault, it's a way of life. Lastly, I take into account the language used to make friendship intelligible in the current neoliberal economic system. They make, uh, they make use of the romantic imaginary as a way to overcome economic hardship. On the contrary, the interviews prove that other forms of relationship make it possible for people to stay afloat. I describe these networks as complicit, in carrying forward a different worldview through collective political strategies against neoliberal individualism. So, in order to challenge the hierarchy of intimacy, we first need to deconstruct two concepts. Heteronormativity, as the supposed universality of relational model based on a couple formed by a cohabiting man and a woman, whose union is registered by the state and built on romantic love, that is meant to last forever, or, a, or, a, or else it will induce a sense of failure in the people involved. The supposed universality of romantic partnership is applied to same-sex couples as well uh, through the concept of homonormativity. The second concept to deconstruct is mononormativity, that is the norm on which romantic love is based, and that requires people to only have one sexual affective relationship at a time. This relationship is meant to have primacy over any other relationship, based on the assumption that it is our partner's duty to take care of all our anxieties, aspirations, desires, and plans, thus causing a form of dependency that can lead to isolation. <coughs> Heteronormativity and mononormativity reinforce each other, leading to the creation of a hierarchy of intimacy. It is actually a well-defined strategy that aims to strengthen not just a moral order, but also an economic one. To explain the hierarchy of intimacy in the economic and patriarchal organization of relationships, I take the cue from the Sul Movimento Nazionale, that is a network of trans-feminist collectives active in Italy and of trans-feminist subjectivities geographically, geographically scattered all over the world. As an alternative, the Sul Movimento Nazionale proposed to talk about other intimacies in order to include not only sexual partners, but all the subjects that constitute the emotional landscape, the sexual possibility, and the material support of people characterized by precarious geographies. Shelley Bajon summarizes the importance of friendship in three points. It offers individuals stable reference points for everyday life. It sustains non-conventional identities through the activity of care. And it gives a sense of belonging that can be claimed and enacted. 
the peculiar case of friends who decide to cohabit as a life choice, the deviant behavior following Friedman's concept is represented precisely by the choice of not living as a couple or within the family. It's a choice that does not comply with the compulsory steps to become adult. Actually, interviews show how deserting these compulsory steps is not a strategy to avoid adult life responsibilities like eternal Peter Pan, but it represents a collective way to create well-being and happiness beyond the monogamous, heteronormative, family-centered system. Um, getting to field work, all the people I interviewed self-define themselves as either lesbian or gay or bisexual. They are between 27 and 48 years old, are currently living in Rome, and all of them are Italian, white, and able-bodied. In sociological terms, all of them have a low economical capital and a high cultural and relational capital. <clears throat> As I was saying before, friendship doesn't grow in a vacuum, but it, it is embedded in a specific historical, geographical and social frame. This means that the shape of friendship does not exclusively depend on the features of people involved but rather on the context that enables the devel develop, development or not of certain relationships. Southern European countries are clustered within the Mediterranean regime that is based on a strong feminism. This family kinship solidarity model, as Manuela Nandini calls it, assumes the breadwinner as responsible not only for the nuclear family, but also for other dependent family members. The interesting aspect of this model is the bridge toward a dimension of care which reaches beyond the narrow nuclear family, since the family kinship solidarity model advances that responsibility is to be shared within the extended family. Although I don't want to romanticize this model based on gender inequality and women's unpaid care work in the private space, I would like to recognize the legacy of this model learned from childhood, it concerns the uh, sharing of big part of family life with relatives well beyond the narrow nuclear family, not only in times of need, but also, and above all, in times of conviviality. In this regard, uh, my colleague and friend Tatiana Motterle refers to non-heterosexual Sunday lunches portrayed by the filmmaker Ferdinand Ospetek describing them as a perfect representation of the idea of family of choice, where reciprocal, reciprocal care is central and love and friendship easily blend. From an economic point of view, crisis and neoliberal austerity policies entail an intensification of precarity that cannot be read as only regarding job insecurity. It affects each dimension of individual biography. The economic frame described by interviewees refers to this context of crisis. Education and cultural cuts, gentrification, precarity as a life condition, the cuts to the national health system, concerns about aging parents, and the prospect of non-retirement benefits for those born in the 80s, such as us. Aspects that are exacerbated by living in a capital such as Rome, as singled out by Veronica, and she says, Several social issues are actually real. It's hard to find a job, and the period of education has been extended in a metropolis where the rent reaches up to five, six hundred euros, including expenses. Actually, lifetimes that are imposed by capitalism are tough. It means that people have even two, three jobs in order to survive. And this is also the homophobic context in which LGBT people choose to move away from their hometown in order to freely claim their non-heterosexuality. After years of homophobic bullying, Dario left his hometown in the south to move in a big city in the north to attend university, ending up as a well-known drag queen. And he says, it was the farthest city that I could reach to attend university. From my shitty life in my hometown in the south, I went to the north. That context had had to free me to be aware about my homosexuality and to freely enjoy it. 
It's also a symbolic context in which friendship is deemed a central payback for disappointing family relationships and empty couple's life. As Eduardo, as Eduardo says, well, I don't think I've been in another relationship for a while, but I should have thought about it already, right after the end of the first one. I feel more satisfied by, by my friends. It's probably the only relationship we should really care about. Emma, which often recalls how friends have been a safe harbor during her difficult times, underlines how living with friends is not just a way to survive in neoliberalism, but it's also a choice of collective living as an ethnic way of sharing daily life through reciprocal support. And she says, I think that my generation's salvation, to say it in a very transient way, is networking. It becomes also salvation, a political choice, but I don't choose it only because it's the only option, instead of starving and dying in this society that exploits and oppresses you, but also because it actually represents how I feel. Here, I employ the word choice to give voice to friendship and its transformative power, especially for people who don't align with conventional models. Obviously, I question the term, because asserting that you can always use the neoliberal motto, yes you can, it only serves to make economic links invisible and to pretend that the materiality of life depends only on our commitment, without taking into consideration class issues. We are not all starting from the same conditions and we don't all have the same tools, but what we choose is to share them between complexity and contradictions. Feminist ethics and care become key concepts in the redefinition of the hierarchy of intimacy within the neoliberal patriarchal system. From collective interviews, care stands out as a central theme that goes beyond all set parameters, namely as not proceeding from institutionalized relationships, as Emma clearly shows by telling how she learned how to communicate and to share thanks to her friends. And she says, Outside my family and the places where I grew up, even outside the couple in a narrower sense, I learned to communicate, to talk about myself and share parts of myself as well. Veronica mentions the widespread care in the squad she lives in, care that is expressed through material support, both in daily life and in extraordinary situations. And she recalls, in our Quote, there is a network of care in our daily lives, and there is also psychological care when inevitably each one of us has to face a difficult situation. So to say, recently one of us had to undergo a surgery, and she couldn't share that with her family, and she has been fully supported by a network of care. All this overflowing care is looking for a language in order to be defined and understood, clashing with the lack of recognition that establishes a hierarchy of intimacies, where institutionalized relationships have a social, legal, and symbolic legitimation, which entails a reinforcement of the relationship itself. Due to this lack of recognition, interviewees often resort to the language of family, the only recognized one in our heteronormative and mononormative society. Therefore, there are examples of people defining friends as brothers. Eduardo recalls with nostalgia the time he used to live with his best friend. I basically consider Federico as my brother. The positive aspect of living together has been, to put it simply, to have my brother always on my back. Accordingly, Alfredo refers to sisterhood when talking about the intensity of his relationship with his two housemates, with whom he also shares the difficulties of the artistic path. This is how sisterhood was born between us, with this very strong and very intense relationship. So we started living together, the three of us, in a very queer way, and it was beautiful because then we started making artistic projects together. So actually, the point is not to ascribe greater value to the relationship among, among siblings. Those terms are employed in, in order to be understood by the outside world, since friendship is not considered as valid as other formal relationships. This shows the ability of language to convey the symbolic power of relationships. This is also why 
uh, another term, family, is used. Dario, Dario uses it to define his strong bond with Erika, his lesbian feminist flatmate, when he explains how protected this relationship makes him feel. And he says, Erika knows that if the cops come, they come for a political problem, she can understand. They come for repression. She will probably even take care of organizing the protest if I get arrested, you see? I mean, she's even closer to me. This part of the family is close to me also for these things. If they arrest me, my mom might stop speaking to me because she doesn't understand what I'm doing. Other interviewees try to make it their own. After all, family is a term loaded with a sense of belonging, and it can be modified to highlight the distance with the family of origin. Uh, before reading the quote, I will give just a little note, because in Italian, when you put an S in front uh, of uh, a word, it stands as an inversive prefix. And it means that it overturns the meaning of the word to which it was premised. Uh, so, Alfredo says, and that's the way this amazing trio was born. We call it the family. I am proud of it, because words matter. It's family because then, before, the, before all these annoying discourses about family had even begun, I had put an S at the beginning, and I intend to enjoy this feeling of belonging. We don't need to say much because we are accomplices. Using a language that evokes mutual respect and common activism, Alfredo defined accomplices in transfeminist terms. This word that has to do with complicity comes more and more to my mind as an excellent alternative allowing to speak about friendship as political. And I think I'm going to write an article about it uh, with my colleague Roberta Granelli, an Italian PhD student, well, here, she's with us in, uh, uh, we were going at the Universidad Autonoma Metropolitana Azcapotzalco two weeks ago, and it's a good picture I mean, regarding city networks, friendship, academic work, and you know, everything together. So as a matter of fact, the English dictionary of Merriam-Webster Merriam defines accomplice as one associated with another, especially in wrongdoing. Etymologically, it comes from Latin, meaning at the same time involved and, and folded together. It refers to a person taking part with others in non-normative actions which is exactly what the people I interviewed mean when they talk about their non-conventional lives. I might suggest that, instead of talking about love, family, friendship, etc., uh, relationships should be divided into two kinds. The ones where self-esteem is hurt, where each decision only gets criticism and bashing in order to generate dependence and isolation, and those relationships which give support through complicity, even within the chaos of precarious lives, thanks to a common desire of sharing reciprocity and solidarity. This may be why the network metaphor is so effective. Using the term network makes clear that friendships cannot be measured on a true people scale and consist instead in a more complex stratification of complicit relationships. And Emma says, what suits me the most is precisely to create and experience networks, because it's the friendship networks that saved me, even more than a rescue network, a network of positive existence, in which you're giving back the beauty of the relationship. People with whom I had the opportunity to experiment the positive aspects of life, of sharing, of freely speaking about oneself, of acknowledging each other, both in difficult and in happy times, and therefore doing beautiful things together. And this quote uh, always moves me a lot. But Emma talks about the beauty of relationships, and beauty is a term that comes over and over in my interviews. Um, so, getting to conclusions. In the Southern European context, the centrality of the couple and the family organizes in a hierarchical form all relationships. Therefore, welfare policies of the Mediterranean regime prove to be totally blind to the change in the intimate and social life. Faced with precarity, interviewed people show how friendship networks 
become not only accessory means, but also a chosen one uh, to build resistant, intimate relationships through a view that decentralizes couple relationships, taking into consideration all sources of care beyond the nuclear family. The objective has been to make feasible new collective political strategies against neoliberal individualism. Complicity thus becomes a way of encouraging the enterprise of carrying forward a new idea of the world. And finally, since I have one minute, minute and since it's the last uh, intimate conference, I would like to close with a positioning that highlights not so much my knowledge of the theoretical framework as my personal and therefore political path. Writing this article has been very difficult, not so much because it speaks of my life and the choices I have made, but rather because it, it is a collective work, one that is made dense, deep and rich by the multidimensionality of the voices that make it up. Unfortunately, the academic production does not do justice to collective polyphony. And this is why the least I can do is naming all the people and all the context that have been important in order to produce this article and this presentation. And, and, and I would like to do this also not to make hierarchies between sources of information. As I was citing activist gray literature uh, at the same level of um, the theoretical framework, I would like to include other people. So, uh, it's kind of obvious, but I want to thank my parents because in the first six years of my life, I've been living in three different families and they made me experiment the three of living uh, with different, uh, not so nuclear families. And I spent a lot of holidays with the previous marriage uh, husband and wife of my parents. Then I thank my political relationship within which these discourses have emerged without knowledge of sociological theories of friendship, but with a deep awareness given by experience and the desire to create other imaginaries. And I would like to thank the accomplices with whom I have, over the years, discussed these topics as much in intimate relationship as in collective spaces, together with the friends uh, at the, the different feminist, trans-feminist uh, events that were listening to my ideas and were doing uh, critiques to the weaker aspects of this paper in a context of equal sharing. And finally, I am grateful to the people I have interviewed who so generously share their stories with me. I sincerely believe that living in networks of solidarity, complicity, and reciprocity is one of the most effective strategies of resistance, not only of survival, in this neoliberal society that wants to convince us that the only safe space is that of narrowly, narrowly conceived family units. 